So welcome everybody. I want to talk about uh, what I call the tactile internet, or it's a whole bunch of us call the tactile internet that have been discussing this, and um, which I believe is going to be the big driver for 5G. It is clearly a, a step forward, not an increment forward, and that's why I think this needs to be discussed. Let's see if I can get this to move. Yes. Okay, this is just a status. Um, this is, these are the startups we've done so far. So for you guys that don't know the newest, three weeks ago we started Exelonix. That is number 10, yes. So uh, Jens, now we're num down to number 10. And um, so 10 startups so far in the area of wireless. And this one is obviously, I'm getting older, so this is in assisted living. And these are our transactions that we've done so far. Um, the most recent transaction was 2012 December and National Instruments bought Signalion. So we have NI now with a big facility in Dresden. Coming to a topic that has been discussed a lot. We have a wireless network with different kinds of access, ways of access. Um, we have our internet somewhere, and what do we want? Yes, somehow we want to have single processing, applications processing, everything somehow within the cloud. This is sort of the big goal. And there has been one goal, and this goal has been also proposed, for example, by China Mobile, by saying let's move everything into the cloud and say we do a cloud RAN, meaning that we have our digital RF sampling, we sample the RF samples through the, we run them through the router and do all the single processing somehow in a cloud RAN box. We have a radio center, we have a data, data center and things like that. Well, um, this very much reminds me of Berkeley's InfoPad project where also people said we're going to get wireless to be accessible everywhere and we can get rid of all the smarts in these things. We'll just have a dumb display, a tablet, and everything else is going to be done all over the place. So for me, this is, again, the same kind of danger of running the wrong way. And why? I'm going to tell you why. If we look at this piece of silicon, which we presented five, no, six years ago in the meantime. Yes, it's a single chip, LTE, WiMAX, baseband. Uh, can run H.264 as well. It's 10 by 10 millimeter in 130 nanometer CMOS. So in 28 nanometer CMOS, we can do a whole complete LTE in 10 square millimeters. Yes, and a chip starts to become reasonable if it's 100 square millimeter size. So that means this LTE is so simple that we can just stuff it somewhere in the corner. It's just an I.O. device. It's like a USB 2.0. Um, so with that in mind, we see processing seemingly becomes ubiquitous. What, has, what is happening is if we look at different ways of looking at electronics, we have to understand the future of what's happening in electronics because electronics is driving the industry, us wireless guys. We're completely dependent upon electronics. And so that's why we put a big center together in Dresden on advancing electronics, looking at what happens beyond CMOS. Another thing that we did or we're doing is uh, we have a twin lab with Mazdar Institute in Abu Dhabi where we're looking at 3D chip stacks and how do you stack chips on top of each other and actually have wireless interconnects between those different chip stacks because we see that if you open up an iPhone 5 and have a big Samsung flash memory inside, 16 chiplets are stacked on top of each other with a wide I.O. interface, 512 pins, uh, clocked with staggering 200 megahertz. Yes, very slow. And the reason is that people right now still don't know really how to build high-speed interconnects and build an internet between chip stacks. So 16 chips stacked on top of each other, flash, is possible today already. So what happens is we have to move into the next world and understand communication as well as wireless, capacitive and inductive coupled communication in these 3D chip stacks to build 100 chips stacked on top of each other. This is going to be feasible. Today already, uh, chips are published that are 15 microns thick, 
When I started my PhD, I designed transistors of 15 micron length. Yeah, so this is quite a big Im change in industry. And these 15 micron thick chips, if you stack 128 of them on top of each other, that's two millimeter height. That's not much. That means we're gonna see a lot of silicon. The next thing, we have to understand how we package systems into big boxes. So within this, we also have a center on building big electronic boxes. And let's have a look at how electronic boxes are gonna build in future. So if we look at the printed circuit board and have chips on this printed circuit board, our highly adaptive energy efficient computing center is looking at the following. How do we connect these chips? Obviously, we connect them with optical interconnects on chip, not, but on board. So one of these chip stacks to the other are all connected with optical waveguides embedded in the printed circuit board. And then if you put these boards next to each other in a stack, then you can, in a box, then you can actually build wireless interconnects. 100 gigabits per second each at a carrier frequency of 220 gigahertz. This is our vision as we have proposed and now we're trying to push it even farther. Having uh, a four by four antenna array on each side uh, for one of those beams means it's two by two millimeter size, which means such an antenna array f easily fits on the so-called interposer on the, and we can put it on the edge of the interposer. We can put 10 arrays on each side. So 40 arrays per chip stack is not an issue, which means if you count this together and say you have 16 chips on the board, we have 60 terabit per second backplane. Today, copper backplanes are limited to 100, and the fastest now are 300 gigabit per second. We're talking about uh, 60 terabit per second, possibly moving up into the petabit per second range with wireless technology. So these are some projects that we've done at the running in and around Dresden making these electronics happen. What does that mean for us? If we look at that, this means we can build such a box. Let's not assume like here we have a, a seven boards in such a box, but only four boards in the box, 128,000 processors per chip. That's not much. An NVIDIA chip has 4K processors today. So this is 32 times more than today. This is not even 10 years away, according to Moore's law. 128 chips stacked on top of each other. If we say 16 is possible today, this is only an eightfold increase. Four by four chips stacked on the board, chip stacks on the board and four boards in a box. This means we are gonna have in one liter, a billion processors, yes? 8,000 chips and a billion processors. A billion processors, today if we take a liter, we can fit about if we're good, 10,000 processors in there. So in a liter, we're gonna get 100,000 times more performance than today. And if we say Moore's law is 10x every five years, so this already would mean that's another um, 25 years of Moore's law ahead of us. Just assuming processing power per cubic inch or per liter. So that will be enough for t uh, 2035. But if you look at this, I didn't put any aggressive numbers up there. It could be happen already much faster, outpacing Moore's law. So that could happen already in the, by 2025. This box, this we call it the hack box. This box is gonna be possible with this kind of enormous processing. And that means we still have a lot of innovation ahead, and this has driven wireless industry. This has driven our 10x data rate increase every five years. So the wireless roadmap continues. Yes, that means if I put down the wireless roadmap here, as you know, I've put it down already many times. I've drawn it till 2015, and if you think it's gonna stop then, forget about it. Yes, it's gonna continue. I only dare drawing it here to 2030, not even to 2040. And cellular will be in the range of 10 to 100 gigabit per second. This is what we have to be able to provide with cellular. And uh, short links have to be, we're doing 100 gigabit per second short links now, but we're gonna have to be 100 terabit per second by 2030 for these kind of short links. So this is really 
an amazing challenge. And the question is, obviously, it's not only driving the data rate, but we have an enormous amount of processing power. It's obviously not clear if there's going to be some slower growth at some point in time, or maybe even faster growth, as I mentioned. Now, data rate is great. Yes? But that's not it. This cannot be 5G. 5G, obviously, higher data rate is going to be part of the story. But if we take an iPhone 4 and if we take an iPhone 5, what's the difference? For European, there's no difference. Why? There's one line more of apps. It's a little lighter. It has an air interface that is not mutable in, in Europe and in many countries on the planet. It's an advantage for Apple engineers sitting in the Silicon Valley. It's a typical example as we heard from William, of a big company designing a product, thinking this is innovation, not realizing this is only innovation for their own engineers and not for the world. Yes, so the difference between this and this is a little bit better for camera. All the competitors have a better camera as well. And uh, that's about it. The amazing thing is that the Apple engineers didn't come to realize that. Because they've done so well before. So if they had put in a second camera down here, we could have 3D imaging. We could recognize our face, not only from a, from a two-dimensional point of view, three-dimensional point of view. We wouldn't have to put in passwords, pins, and things like that anymore. We could just hold the camera against us. It would recognize our face in a 3D fashion. Off we'd go. We could measure things. We could do a complete scan of this room and things of that kind. So all this was not envisioned by these guys and not by anybody else so far. The big importance, what was the big importance, what was the success of Apple's iPhone? Initially, the iTunes. Then came these additional features, the censoring and whatever. Moving it around, seeing that you can play games, you can do all kinds of things with it. So this is very important to understand that we, as wireless engineers, we can generate technology to increase data rate, but there's something else we also have to watch out for, that we don't increase data rate in a brute force fashion, and find out that's not it. So the question is, what could be it? And uh, I believe it could be the tactile internet. So over the last three years, I've been talking to physiologists, psychologists, and others um, about human interaction, trying to understand what is human interaction, yes? Um, and I gave a first little glimpse of this when Lowry was on stage at TTM, basically sort of a predecessor of this here in a broader sense in Dresden. Uh, human interaction can be seen at different scales. Yes, we have sort of the motoric interaction for an unprecedented occurrence. A fly comes, we feel it, we hit it, it takes about a second to react. The other interaction that we have is if we talk to each other, we know for real-time telephony, we need a 100 millisecond real latency uh, to be the latency of our communication has to be within 100 millisecond. This means if we walk further than 30 meters apart, yes, uh, in the hallway, then we'd have more than 100 millisecond latency because this is um, basically the speed of sound in air. And so we don't have real time interaction anywhere. We have walkie talkie. But good news is wireless is faster. It's uh, because we use. Uh, electromagnetic waves which travel at 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second or 300,000 kilometers per second. But that is not so much actually. Um, the third interaction that we know of is our eyes, yes? So our eyes need a shutter speed of 100 hertz, 10 millisecond. And interestingly, we have a tactile feedback that we work on when we're on a skateboard or things like that, which is in the 1 millisecond range. So if we look at the implications for us as engineers in wireless communication or in communication in general, this is what we see as a requirement coming to internet web browsing. We click on a web link and we don't know the content yet, then within one second the web page has to be built up. If it's faster, we're wasting energy. 
If it's lower, it's not real time. If we know the web page that's coming, we should be faster. Yes, so this is an unprepared web link. We know lip synchronization has to also be within 100 milliseconds, otherwise it doesn't look good. This is 100 hertz. And this is real our tactile interface. Think of the following. You take a touch screen, you move an object on your touch screen. Your speed of your finger is about a one meter per second. That is a thousand millimeter per second or one millimeter per millisecond. If we'd move the object around and had a lag, a latency of 10 milliseconds, it would be a, a centimeter behind your finger. You see that. If it's a 100 millisecond latency, it's 10 center behind your finger. That's really bad. I mean, we're talking really bad interfaces. So there is a tactile visual feedback that is really fast, faster than the speed of our nerves. Because our neural speed is 120 meters per second. The high firing rate of our neurons is typically 100 hertz. If we're alert, then it goes up to 10 kilohertz. Uh, so every 100 microseconds, we have a firing of our nerves. That means about one meter length to our brain is about 10 milliseconds. But the thing is that we are steering something and we are preempting to see something already so that we don't really feel it. And that is basically why we have this preemptive reaction where we learn in the order of one millisecond kind of latency is required. Gaming parties are known. That's where we see these kind of speeds are really necessary because try to do a gaming across the Atlantic, a millisecond at 300 kilometers per millisecond gets, gets you only 300 kilometers far. So gaming via the Atlantic, crossing the Atlantic is going to give you about 100 millisecond latency no matter what you do, due to the speed of light. Speed of light is way too slow. Uh, Entertainment industry. If you've talked to Bose, Sennheiser, Sure, and all these companies, you find out that they know this. The, the latency between the microphone going to the mixing desk and then into the headset of the different musicians is four milliseconds. It has to be four milliseconds. Otherwise, if I go like this and it's longer than four milliseconds, then I get out of sync as a professional player. Interestingly, as an amateur, it's for an unprepared amateur, it's 15 milliseconds. For the pros, it's four milliseconds. There you see again, there's a, that's exactly the difference between a Formula One race car driver and a regular car driver, yes? These are the different reaction times of people training uh, their reaction. And they say that basically some of these reflexes are trained and learned, and some of the signal processing happens already uh, on the neural strand on the way to your brain. Same thing, if we fly a remote heli, it can feel like driving a Buick. You turn the wheel and wait, and wait for something to happen. Same thing here, you fly a heli, you always preempt what's going to be happening. It's sort of wiggly and jiggly. It's not really tied to your iPhone. And the reason is the iPhone has a sampling rate of typically 10 milliseconds to 20 milliseconds, depending upon the load on the arm, uh, on the, uh, yes, on the arm CPU. And uh, so that's why, and then there's still the Wi-Fi latency, th which gives you this kind of Buick feeling when flying the uh, heli. So what do we want? We want to make sure that we obviously control traffic not this way, but somehow this way, or even this way, right? And this means we have to really start taking control of our environment with wireless technology and get rid of traffic lights. If we could get rid of traffic lights, I mean, this is a vision 20, 30 years out, obviously, because um, then we could get rid of half of our streets, uh, the pavement, because most of the pavement in downtown areas is parking lots in front of red lights. Uh, the other thing is you turn on your phone and you just walk across the street and the car zigzag around you, right? There's no reason why a car should bump into you. Um, next is if you take this and look at what's happening in the millisecond range in cars today, it's ESP and ABS, yes? So all the anti-skidding and everything in the cars is already happening at the millisecond. If we really want to make this safe, 
we have to make sure that this car, ESP, is also talking to the neighboring cars and everything is synced so that if this starts breaking out, the others can move away. So that's when you get this kind of millisecond control loops into, into platooning, I call it platooning 2.0. Another area of interest would be, I think it's, this is big business, gigantic business, is exoskeletons. Think of being able to go in the yard, cut down a tree, lifting big trunks and whatever all. I mean, you can do that if you have an exoskeleton on. Obviously, it can be a weapon if you don't watch out that it communicates with the surrounding. Otherwise, you just walk into that door and walk through the door, right? I mean, there's no reason why the exoskeleton shouldn't just walk you right through the door. So you have to have a lot of sensing, communication, making sure that these things are synchronized and that this person does not accidentally make this person fall and straddle and be massively hurt. If we get to that level, we can do, for example, remote physiotherapy. Here there's a meter of new snow outside, uh, ice on, on the ground, I'm 85 years old. I want to go to my physiotherapy because I have a broken left leg. Instead of having a broken right leg as well, I just put on my exoskeleton and have the physiotherapist do the physiotherapy, but then that has to be real time in the one to 10 millisecond range, remote within about a 10 kilometer range. This is possible. This is super fast speed. One millisecond is way not enough for that, but we can do preemptive Kalman filtering, Wiener filtering for looking at what happens, yes. So in, again, if you do augmented reality, uh, virtual reality, this is where you need these super high speeds of one to 10 milliseconds of really making sure that things are put into the dashboard of the car, overlaid on whatever, in a way that it looks like it's real. We are talking to, the, to three sports, Olympic sports training centers of Germany in Halle and in Berlin, water sports, where this is extremely important for synchronizing the paddle stroke and making sure that uh, the muscular buildup is in the right way. And if you take this to the next level, you can make this available in every gym that you're connected and you have the optimum uh, program running according to what uh, an instructor who is sitting somewhere else is telling you to do. This is all a super fast, high speed, real time communication. And finally, something that I want to mention because it's also mentioned a lot by Ericsson, saying that LTE can do it. Yes, smart grid, it can be done by, L by LTE, but only one part of it. There's two parts of a smart grid. The one is controlling the power. This has to be around 100 millisecond speed. And the second is controlling the phase. Because if you don't co-phase all the suppliers, then you basically kill the network, right? Because you have to be within 50 hertz, 60 hertz. Yeah, uh, you have to be between around a 20 degree phase coherency between all the different suppliers. And, and to make sure that this is possible, you need it within a kilo 10 kilometer range about one millisecond sub-network synchronism, which is about the 20 degree phase difference at 50 or 60 hertz. So this is basically yet another area where the smart grid is really important for synchronization. So we need something in this range of one milliseconds, uh, one to 10 milliseconds maybe, for everything, for these incidents to control the environment, to come to complete new ways of traffic, sports, education, health and care, Manufacturing, if you look at all the manufacturing buses in robotics, they're all 0.5 millisecond latency, profi bus and whatever, all. I didn't talk about that, so this is manufacturing, game, smart grid, the whole thing. Shebang is possible with these very short latencies. For us wireless communications people, what does that mean? Why haven't we come from a content communication up to now to this steering and control level communication of the future? The reason is, this means we need an air interface, for example, of 100 microsecond latency. Yes, 100 microsecond latency. Assuming that the sensor actuator does not have an ADD converter that consumes already 100 microseconds, those do exist, those ADD converters. 
So really super fast flash A to D converters. We have to go through the embedded system, go through the operating system, tunnel through the f not to the PHY, but first through the protocol stack into the PHY, then fill a packet. After we fill the packet, transmit it, then receive it, then do error correction, decoding, etc., etc. Yes, so a packet can be possibly 25 microseconds long, most. An LTE OFDM symbol is 70 microseconds long, bad idea. So LTE cannot be it. Yes, obviously, this is a complete different world. Going to the hosted computer decider and back again. And think of this hosted computer decider. What does it have? It has a billion processor cores. Yes, so we need time to get to our core that makes the decision and get out of this mesh of million process, billion processor cores into the modem again. So it is a massive real-time problem. And if you now think of doing this somewhere in Alaska, the Phi single processing, a cloud RAN approach, you're right there, you're going the wrong route because we have to save every microsecond on the road. Yes, we have to make sure that the hosted computer is as close as possible to the antenna as possible. Yes, we have to take exactly the savvy approach or other approaches of that kind where we really take the processor and distribute it, the compute power distributed into the RAN network. Obviously, there's some additional requirements like we, make sure we have to make sure that if things do go wrong, because now it's about saving lives or possibly fatalities involved, that accounting and our, uh, that we have uh, archiving, we have to make sure that we authorize, we have to be failure resilient, so not one physical air interface can be available to the terminal at once. We need at least two or three. We need some kind of uh, diversity there. Because if one base station goes down, or if a person stands in front of the base station, we have to make sure, or a truck, that the other base station still has access. Attacker resilience, not only from an IT point of view, but I mean, if kids turn on their iPhone or their whatever phone into this mode of the cars not bunkering into them, and they start throwing it across the street back and forth, making sure that the big Mercedes and, uh, and Volvos stop whenever they feel like it, this means attacker resilience of a different kind and obviously eavesdropping and security. So we have to go not f into a cloud RAN, but we really have to move as much as possible these billion processor boxes, cores, as close to the physical air interface as possible. This is a liter. A liter is this large. I mean, it's, it's basically a little more than a fist. A billion cores in a fist. Think of that. Yes, so we have to really distribute the compute power uh, within the cloud to make this kind of things happen. We put together a project proposal, a hundred million euro project proposal. We're, wa we're waiting. It's going to be hopefully approved in the next six weeks uh, on exactly this topic with these companies involved, uh, just trying to spec out what is really the research challenge in that. So with this, I hope I've shown you that I believe 2G was about voice and messages. 3G is a lot about data and positioning. 4G, I believe, is video and 3D graphics. And 5G, of course, more graphics, more data, more whatever all, but the added thing on top is really the control, making all the things connected and making sure that we have really control and steer our environment in a real time. Thanks a lot. Questions and comments? Eric. Uh, thank you very much. I think it was very interesting. And I partly I very much agree with your tactile ideas here. Uh, you brought up a lot of different applications going from like cameras where you get information into gaming. Uh, exoskeletons, paddles for Olympic canoes. Do you, did you see I mean, that all those kind of things would be like handled by one single system, where it was like different applications where in general low latency could be needed? Well, I think that 
cellular innovation always happens in the ISM band first. Let me explain. Yes? I was in the US when uh, we were designing a IS54 chipset, the first digital cellular chipset for Texas Instruments, who didn't know how to design chipsets. Yes, we're a small contract development consulting company in Berkeley. We did the same thing for AT&T Microelectronics, for Asai Kasei, for all kinds of different companies. And it turned out that I looked at the market and then GSM popped up and Americans didn't take GSM seriously. Why? Because there were 20 million cellular subscribers in the US and the rest of the world was 2 million subscribers. So, I mean, the market of cellular is the US. The rest of the world doesn't count. Then GSM popped up and if you looked at the, at the rate of success of GSM in different countries, it typically happened first, I mean, talking about initial bootstrapping, if a country had 10% penetration of, with, of cordless telephony. So we first get used to talking cordless, not paying extra, and then we see the added value, and then we like to pay extra. Same thing with data. Wi-Fi has been an enabler for 3G data. Yeah, because people just get used to Wi-Fi all over the place and then they want to have access to data all over, also where there's no Wi-Fi availability and then they use cellular. So here again, just to give it, make it right, yes, I do believe we need one standard that does all, but I do believe that we can build an ISM-based solution like for factory automation first, for, uh, for the Olympic training centers first, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Wi-Fi derivatives uh, uh, or Wi-Fi AE or whatever it's going to be at that time first to show that it has an added value, get into these systems and then go to the broader cellular market. And do you then think that that kind of solution would then encompass all kind of applications or just this kind of low latency applications? Do you see like this single 5G technology would replace everything else in the long term? I mean, this is like the pocket calculator hasn't been killed by the laptop and by the phone. You still can buy pocket calculators. Is the market big? No. So the same thing is true. I mean, 2G, looking at Nokia, just announced the big 2G uh, phones, right? Smartphones. Uh, 2G is still not dead, even though we're rolling out 4G today. So once we have 5G, obviously we're going to see that the others start taping away. But I don't say, I wouldn't be there to say that turn off one of those standards because we don't need it anymore. I don't know, I'm more like, do you see that it will be able to handle everything that the previous technologies can do? I think it will have okay. it, yes. I think we will must make sure that it has it. As an example, for one millisecond latency, let's take a 10 microsecond packet size just to make it simple, yes? And let's say that we have a 10 kilobit control packet that we need to transmit with the overhead. This means the fire rate is 100 megabit per second. Instantaneous, during the packet transmission. That means low latency comes with high data rate. We couldn't do a millisecond latency with an edge air interface because the packets are just too big and too slow and too long. Yes, yeah, so that means Obviously, if we get to this very low latency, we come to high data rates so that we can grab that part of the pie. The only thing that still needs to be added on top or in, in there too is this sensor networking, machine to machine, 25 bytes, AAA battery, 10 years kind of approach, which I think is an yet another challenge, but that is something we're going to have to incorporate in 5G anyway. Okay, Julian? Yes, <laughs> okay. First, um, on behalf of InfoPad, even though I was never involved in it, but uh, I have dear friends who were in Berkeley. Me too. Who, friends who are still in Berkeley Wireless Research Center. Uh, from their point of view, InfoPad was the right thing, but too early. Because the research group there that did InfoPad also did something like Street View. So InfoPad was 15 years too early ahead of the iPad. But basically, iPad is a modern, elegant realization of the idea of InfoPad. So, t 
to say that it was the wrong direction, I'm not sure I agree with you. Second, I have to say that uh, before coming to this summit, I wasn't sure, I wasn't aware of the tactile uh, communication or connectivity, which uh, I really appreciate. It's uh, very intriguing. And uh, among all the brave new world that uh, the 5G visionary uh, story that I have heard, I think this, yours has been the most, uh, I think, intriguing and uh, uh, exciting. Um, but uh, similar to the previous uh, audience's comments, I was wondering with all this exciting new capabilities and new applications, do you really see them of equal importance in the future 5G platform? Or is there one or two that you think would be the killer ones that uh, would have a good business case as well as uh, the capability enabled by the 5G technology? Uh, what's the thinking on that? Because if I look at your hack box, it's uh, extremely exciting, but it's, it's like you are assuming that um, we will have a supercomputer capability in every single end node in the network, including um, access point type, right. terminal, uh, right. you know, a caliber of the cost as well as power consumption. Is this what you envision that will be possible? at 5G era? Yes, I think within the, f I mean, 5G will happen from 2022 to 2032, let's say. Yes, because we sort of had 2G in 1992, 3G in 2002, 4G in 2012, 5G 2022, plus minus. Uh, don't get me, so, and it's sort of the 10 year era from 2022 to 2032, plus another five year extension as always, Yes, the previous standard evolves still for another five years while the next standard is being in introduced. Uh, within that era, we'll see this kind of technology, maybe not a billion, but at least a million cores, enter in every kind of Wi-Fi box and whatever. Let's say feasibility of it, yes, at a fairly low cost. So I think we really have to watch out for applications that are going to pop up where this kind of processing power is going to be cheaply available all over the planet. This also means, obviously, I do have the processing power. I think this is, for, like for China Mobile, this is a very good news. Why? Because if I download an app to do some real-time control of my environment that includes this, I need to download the app into my mobile device, and I need to download the app into the RAN object, yes, the RAN uh, base station equivalent, yes, the RAN component that has a compute power because I need that local compute hosted by you guys. Yeah, this is basically, uh, if you look at Akamai, how they're doing their rollout and getting their very fast s response times on their servers. This is exactly by renting space in your rooms and distributing the data centers already into the telco operators' rooms to make sure that they don't have the Google 25 millisecond latency, but actually can get down to five milliseconds with an Akamai server, right? So, I mean, they already are moving exactly that route and you can rent your space already to Akamai. So the same thing will happen now for every single app that you download. You can not only rent the space, but you can rent sort of the compute power in your RAN service. So that from the 99 cents, maybe 19 or whatever cents go to the operator that hosts this. And this is something I think is really s important to see, yes, that I think this is something imp which can change the industry because this can revitalize the operator's business because you can really add value to your network by providing high speed and not being just the dumb bit pipe. Uh, go on. Oh, yes. Uh, thanks for this very n inspiring like, uh, presentation. I have some questions. I would say it's like, uh, to summarize, it's like we are trying to provide a seamless uh, experience in both space time and uh, now in feelings, our personal feelings in our perspectives. So that means uh, that really poses a lot of challenges in the design from both individual terminals to the whole networks. But on the other hand, in order for this technology to take off, or I mean for the proliferation of all these ecosystems, that means we really need to make sure it's 
very cost efficient in both like uh, manufacturing and also in yes. maintaining, right? Yes. So how can you deal with these issues? And also, I mean, when we are trying to tackle these issues, right? Uh, which side, I mean, regarding, for example, the terminal side or the network side, should we emphasize more so that we can finally find a proper trade-off so that it will fly sometime in the future, yes. I wouldn't say you can emphasize terminal side or base station side more. Personally, it, it wireless is always a two-ended system. If you don't do the one thing and the other thing at the same time, then you're going to not get a solution. Yes, so, I mean... Uh, if you look at all application examples, er, all successes, typically both sides have to be taken into account. So I wouldn't necessarily see that. And the other question, if I got it right, was on the cost side, right? Yes. I'm not scared of the cost. Why should I be scared of the cost? I mean, transistors are there, they're available, they're cheap. I think the main cost now it's like uh, we want to achieve, especially this, for example, 10, a uh, 100 microsecond delay requirement. So that's a lot of uh, requirement in the, the air, air interface de design. Yeah. So I don't think there's any limit in the circuit or uh, those part. But uh, now it's like we need to redesign the protocols, and especially if there are so many devices, they are all competing for accessing the center network, for example. Right. Yeah, and we need basically what we need to come up with is a very good architecture for our compute engine that is sitting in every single node, radio node, right? And if we come up with sort of our the PC equivalent, and if you think of, I mean, there are 10 billion uh, base stations being ro 10 million, sorry, not billion, 10 million base stations rolled out every year today already. PC industry was a big industry when uh, 10 million PCs were sold per year. So this is uh, basically at the same level. If each of these nodes has one of these compute boxes, whatever it is, if, I mean, this is a visionary slide that I showed you. Yeah, but it's some kind of a compute box uh, embedded in there. This is a big market. And then you can, I mean, the scale of this is so big that you can make these individual components fairly cheap. I think that's not going to be the issue. But importantly enough, again, wireless will be a driver of the silicon. Yeah, we have to learn a lot about electronics and silicon to make sure that our wireless is correct. But we also very much determine the silicon industry and their success because we're going to fill all their wafers. Yes, and Thank I mean you. that's also important to see. Just a question, yeah. uh, Gab. Uh, I still think. Um, what you're proposing is still a sort of centralized architecture. I mean, uh, it's p still the cloud. You communicate with the cloud. I think that that's quite important so that these uh, um, uh, servers that you put close to the edges mm. are, are still part of the cloud. So I communicate with the cloud as a, from a user perspective. I think that that's quite important because we're really good at, at uh, uh, building machines that can do uh, lots of simple things. But it's very difficult when you start when you get too much interaction between these machines. Then then things get complicated, and we are not really good at that. And yes, so and yeah, 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 yeah. But, but let's put it this way: we can learn a lot from looking at the human body. Mm -hmm. Yes, if I hit here, I I get a reflex, and my leg goes up, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we know these reflexes happen because we have a computational yep. node sitting here in our knee. It's not a brain, but it's basically just the interaction of the nerves mm -hmm. sitting there. Uh, we have the same thing, then it goes to our s CPU, our brain sitting here, and then the external brain parts, which are sort of main memory and all that kind of stuff yeah. around it. So we have a distributed control system, yeah. and the same thing will happen here. We will not get rid of our cloud server sitting in yeah. uh, kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Wherever we don't need the latency, we want to move it, push it into the yeah. cloud as much as, uh, yeah. so far away from the radio as much as we can into some, cen some centralized mm -hmm. control. So don't get me wrong on that. Yeah, 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 yes, I'm but I'm we have to, like an onion, we have to peel it per every 10 milliseconds yeah. for any, every order of latency mm -hmm. and say this we do here, that we do there, and this we finally do in Alaska. Yeah, I definitely agree, but it's still sort of hierarchical system. Yes. Um, our knees are very bad at communicating. That, that yes. Is the, that is the... The problem. I think that's also why the multi-hop networking had, had so much big problems because you have too much distributed, uh, too many yeah, I mean distributed processes that, that have difficulties right, interacting. I mean right. One of my favorite applications, which has nothing to do with speed, just to show you how we need this kind of distributed processing, is 
what video guys are doing today, right? They're putting in 36 cameras into a soccer stadium, once around the stadium, and then you can look at 32 times quad HD streams coming in, and it's rendered in one big machine, and you can have your joystick, and you can basically zoom into the soccer player, virtually run around the soccer player and see what's happening as if you're running around on the, on the soccer field. It's fantastic. Now, if you go one step f further, and you'd go to a performance of one of your kids, playing violin, playing soccer, whatever all, all the moms and dads are holding up their iPhones or their smartphones today, videotaping this, right? In part, streaming it in real time already to the grandma sitting at home. If you combine all this and render this in the base station in one of those boxes, you don't have to pipe 26 moms' phones and dads' phones all the way to different grandmas. You can actually render this, bring this to one database, and stream the 3D database over. It has huge added value and much less data on the backbone than if you stream every individual stream. So, I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch of different applications where you see this kind of stuff being interesting and important. Yes? Mauri Onkonen from Nokia. Uh, when reaching for the well, one, one millisecond latency, so how do you see the role of, of device to device communication instead of kind of routing everything from, uh, through the cloud? Ha! Huh. Uh, so far, as a radio person, I have looked at device to device many times. I mean, if we have an FDD system, it's sort of difficult, right? Because we're, we don't have any advantage on an FDD system if we go to device to device. So we have to go TDD. And as we go to cell sizes of 100 meters and less, TDD starts making sense. And then device to device might make sense as well. So if we take, I think it's going to be in some safety critical situations, for example, it'll be a combination of multiple. Let's take the automatic traffic crossing, yes, intersection. Uh, in that case, uh, if you look at what's happening in airplane business today, we have the ILS, instrument landing system, which is sort of a, this, it's a similar thing. We have an infrastructure talking to all the different airplanes with the autopilots flying in. And then they lock into the ILS and land the plane, which is almost like a device device locally. So you have multiple systems. The same thing here. We will have the centralized control to cars. Then we will have car to car communication to make sure that if that centralized controller f falls down or doesn't have the right information, we can sort of back it up by that. And then we still have the driver sitting in there that has to be alert and gri grabbing a hold of the wheel in case it is necessary. So you will have to have sort of overlay of different systems. So I'm not going to say device to device is not going to happen. Not at all. I just say it probably will play, I do say it probably will play a less, lesser role in many of these things because as long as it's centrally controlled, yes, we can guarantee services. As soon as it's device to device, we don't have this service guarantee anymore. So one last question. Okay. Thank you for this. For this presentation, uh, give us a very beautiful 5G uh, vision. But uh, I have one, two questions. The first is about the 3D hack. So, how do you think about the power consumption of this chipset? Because do you, do you, cause now the cover power consumption, especially for the terminal, uh, is very crucial for us. Today, you only a smartphone can only work one day, and uh, it, 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 it takes a very long time to improve this. I think it's not easy to, for example, in 2020, I, my expectation, at least we can, our smartphone can work at least one week. But I don't think your new, new chipset can support even lower consumption. Let's talk about two things. First of all, if we talk about the tactile steering and control, yes, um, let's assume, just as a working assumption, a 10 microsecond packet, or let's say 20 microsecond packet, and uh, we have a we have a packet every millisecond, right? So we have 50 packets. Uh, we have a 50 to one as. Uh, 
ratio between on and off. Okay, so that means that, yes, you have a high-speed data rate, 100 megabits per second during the burst, but then you also are off for quite some long time, which is exactly what 3G is not. Due to TDMA, you have the issue. So it's more like a TDMA system. Actually, we have to go all, in, all the way almost like to circuit switch because we have to guarantee that we blip that packet every millisecond. Yeah, I mean, this goes back to circuit switch, kind of. It's almost going back to ATM. Uh, sorry for saying that. Um, that's the one side. So, and then if you have that kind of on-off ratio, even if we consume, let's say, 10 watts during the on time, the average is only 1 50th of that, which is much less. So this is, and then you can get control times which are easily manageable for these kinds of, uh, for long, for multi-day operations. So that I don't think is the issue. Um, the other thing that happens, obviously, by the way, one application which I think is really cool, also for senior citizens, is what's happening in the US, is that people are working on remote control cars. Yes, if you're 85, you don't feel like driving your car anymore, you just call up 1-800-DRIVE-MY-CAR, and then you get into your car and somebody sits in the control center and drives your car through the traffic. That has to be real-time tactile control, right? Otherwise, the whole thing doesn't work. But then you also have a car battery, which is a little bigger than just a cell phone. So, I mean, there are a ton of applications that are big, really big, yes, which, uh, which will happen for sure, like the remote control car. I, I totally believe that will happen. Um, but which are not so power you don't have to be that power aware, so it's okay to bootstrap the markets in there. And then uh, talking about the other power thing that I didn't talk about is how about this hack box power, yes? Now if every processor sitting in there, there's a billion processors in there, were consuming one microwatt on average, it still would be a kilowatt. Okay, a kilowatt is possible to get it out of a liter, but it's a lot. Yeah, so there's, yes, there's still some challenges there that I don't want to hide that need to be addressed, obviously, yes, to get to the uh, really low power kind of uh, solutions. But I don't assume that every processor is on the continuously. <laughs> okay, I think we'll uh, need to uh, wrap up the session. I'd thank, like to thank Gerd once more. I just want to mention one thing, by the way, sorry for saying, there's a, a sneak sort of little write-up on Microwave Journal and Siavash Alamuti and I are writing a paper right now for Communications Magazine that should be published in the next, early next year on this vision in a bigger sense. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.